Welcome to the Gastro Girl Podcast. We bring together patients, experts, and health advocates who are all here to help you optimize your health. Here's your host, Jacqueline Gollin. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Gastro Girl Podcast. This episode is geared towards advanced practice providers who are non-GI. And this episode is brought to you by Sanofi Regeneron. We're going to talk today with Dr. Pooja Singh Hall of Oklahoma Gastro Health and Wellness. It's in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Welcome, Dr. Singhal. How are you? Hi, Jackie. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here again and discuss this very important topic with you this afternoon. A lot of people have assumed EOE is a rare disease, eosinophilic esophagitis, but we're talking about it more and more. We're seeing more patients engaging with questions and also um, at our events, advanced practice providers having lots of questions. So this is perfect timing to have you on again today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. It truly has increased in prevalence, actually. It used to be a rare disease, you know, that nobody really knew about 20, 30 years ago. Um, in fact, it was first kind of characterized in 1990s. And it's been very interesting to track this specific entity because now we are seeing more and more of eosinophilic esophagitis diagnosed both in kids, young teenagers, and adults. So I'm so glad that you're taking time to address this. Oh, thank you. So for those who may not know what EOE is, and we have lots of videos and podcasts that we've done about this, and they can check them out on our previous podcast for more in-depth information. But just briefly, for those who may start it with this uh, podcast episode, what is EOE or eosinophilic esophagitis? Yeah, great question, Jackie. So eosinophilic esophagitis, just like the name mentions, it is esophagitis, which means inflammation of the esophagus. Um, and that's characterized by high number of eosinophils, which are a type of cell that deposits in the esophagus and can cause disease in the esophagus, can lead to inflammation of the esophagus. So it's an immune-mediated kind of increase deposition of an eosinophil, which is a cell that's commonly found in all of us. Great. Thank you for that. So as we talk about specific insights for the advanced practice provider, what is the clinical presentation of EOE? What might they see in the practice? Yeah. So the clinical symptoms with EOE actually can vary in uh, children, young adults, and and then just adults. So in children or youth, you may have somebody who's presenting with vomiting or abdominal pain or, you know, kind of the gr off being growth chart because of feeding difficulties for a prolonged time. So you have to be a little vigilant about that to see, could this be something more than just other possibilities for those symptoms. So we are seeing this particular disorder presenting with more of those symptoms. So again, those are feeding, feeding disorders or vomiting or abdominal pain in younger children and, you know, preteen population. And in adults, um, you have to have this definitely in differential diagnosis and anybody who's presenting now with reflux, definitely with difficulty swallowing, or anybody who has been to the ER for food impaction, or I just had a patient um, yesterday who in clinic who was like, you know, I've had reflux for so many decades, and I usually have food getting stuck, but I'm able to dislodge it. So a lot of people, you know, have had adaptive behaviors uh, to deal with this um, disease. So it's very important when we are listening to patients and patients are presenting with these symptoms of reflux, regurgitation, food getting stuck, it's important to think of eosinophilic esophagitis in the differential diagnosis. So that's a great point. And it might not come up in a doctor's appointment. If you're seeing your primary care physician, they could be coming to their doctor's appointment for their regular annual checkup. Yeah. So what would prompt a doctor or, an, or a nurse practitioner to ask questions that would be related to EOE? Yeah, absolutely. I think the very first question, you know, anybody who is an adult, especially 
anybody who's a Caucasian male or anybody who has a bit of overweight or obesity, it's very important to just ask about reflux symptoms. Hey, are you having any heartburn, any nocturnal symptoms? Do you have a clearing of throat, cough at night? That's just the basic initial screen for, hey, are you having reflux? And if that, that usually leads to, oh yeah, I've had chronic reflux. And if it doesn't, then you can ask, are you having any difficulty swallowing? Now, for the patients who are presenting with, oh, I have reflux, uh, there is a great mnemonic of questions to ask, and that's usually impact. And I really love that mnemonic because it goes over adaptive behaviors that usually do not come up. So impact stands for, I is for imbibe. Like, are you drinking a large amount of water or fluids to help pass the food down? M, so impact, M, are you modifying foods? Are you cutting them, blending them, pureeing them to be able to swallow? P is for prolonged meal time. So I actually had a nanny who would sit there for one hour and just chew a very small meal. So like just being cognizant of prolonged meal times is very important. Avoiding IMPA is for avoiding harder texture foods, really gravitating towards softer foods. C for chew, chewing excessively to really masticate and break the food down before swallowing because they're having trouble swallowing uh, in the esophagus and they may not realize that. And the T of impact, turning away pills and tablets. So those are some of the questions to delve a little deeper or really kind of um, delineate whether they may have more than just reflux. When they're in the, they're asking their patients these questions, when is it appropriate to refer to a gastroenterologist? I think that's a very good question because um, this is a common symptom. Reflux is a very common symptom. So when do you actually refer out to a gastroenterologist? I think when it comes to reflux symptoms, it's important to have a good follow-up, and especially when they are talking about difficulty swallowing. So I think it's reasonable to, if you have a patient who's having reflux symptoms that are mild, meaning it's less than two, less than two to three times a week or and they don't have any nighttime symptoms because that's important. If they don't have nighttime symptoms, if they have milder symptoms, less frequent than two to three times a week, then it's appropriate to treat them with a good follow-up to make sure they have a response. However, if they are having symptoms more than three times a week or and or if they're having nighttime symptoms where they're aspirating, regurgitating at night, clearing their throat, they have a nighttime cough that's not going away, it's very important then to refer them to a gastroenterologist and have a further workup because it's important for us to go and evaluate with upper endoscopy. Um, It's also very important if somebody has had a food impaction or they're like casually sitting and being like, oh yeah, I choke on my food and somebody had to give me a Heimlich maneuver or I had to just kind of, you know, um, self-induced vomiting to dislodge it. That dysphagia or food getting stuck should always have further testing and be referred to a gastroenterologist for upper endoscopy. So what can these patients expect? So when an advanced practice provider is speaking with their patient and they make the referral to a gastroenterologist, what are they referring for and what's going to happen next so they can educate their patient on what to expect? Absolutely. Yes. So they are, they are referring to the gastroenterologist because they want to they want to make sure that the nighttime symptoms are not because the patient has a large hiatal hernia that may need surgical repair or that may need more aggressive medical management. There are also with nighttime symptoms, there is increased risk for Barrett's esophagus to make sure that we are not missing that. And if they have that, we have a close surveillance. And then most importantly, um, 
referring to gastroenterologists to rule out eosinophilic esophagitis, which is a diagnosis made both on clinical suspicion, clinical tr- uh, symptoms, and um, on EGD with biopsy. So endoscopically, there are signs that suggest eosinophilic esophagitis. And then on tissue samples, and this is the most important part, we take tissue samples from the mid-esophagus and lower esophagus, and we are specifically looking for how many eosinophils per high-power field there is. And usually the cutoff is if they have 15 or more eosinophils on that tissue sample, it's diagnostic of eosinophilic esophagitis. So that's kind of the goal. And that's one of the reasons to refer to gastroenterologists for those main things. So thank you for that. So once the patient is diagnosed, what treatment options are presented to them? And how does that work in collaboration with their primary care provider? Fantastic question, because the treatment of EOE, as I alluded to before, it's a relatively new disease entity. So it's about 30, 35 years old. And in in last three decades, the treatment has really revolutionized. So before we used to, you know, have recommendations of dietary elimination and uh, four food elimination diet, six food elimination diet. We would refer these patients to for allergy testing. And that's still a very appropriate recommendation to have these patients tested for allergies. And then there, so now the treatment options also include, you know, proton pump inhibitor, the class of proton pump inhibitor medications like pentaprazole, lansoprazole, or omeprazole. So that medication therapy is up to 40% effective in eosinophilic esophagitis. More recently, now we have um, a revolutionary medication option, uh, which is Dupexent on the market uh, that has had great results um, in the world of eosinophilic eosinophilic esophagitis. And um, in order to get that approved, um, you have to have proper diagnostic criteria met, which is the biopsies and the clinical suspicion. It's very also very important to document if they have tried proton pump inhibitors and all the medications they may have tried uh, in the past and what the response has been to these medications. Great. Are there any other options that doctors should know about or APP should know about at this time? For, for treatment of EOE, yes. well, yes. So the dietary uh, recommendation that I told you, dietary uh, elimination, and then also swallow topical corticosteroid, which is usually uh, fluticasone or butyrosinide. You can, you can give them in a compounded formulation and they swallow that medication. So it's, it's effective. It's partially effective. And then, you know, there, there are some side effects, like there are side effects to everything, but that, that is one of the therapies currently that is also being used for eosinophilic esophagitis. To, so just to recap, there is dietary elimination with asthma allergy testing. There is class of medication called PPI, which, is, which includes pantoprazole, lansoprazole, omeprazole, isomeprazole that you can do at high doses. There is topical swallowed steroids, and then there is um, Dupexit, which is the most recent. And that's a biologic. That's a biologic, yes. So the good news is there are options for their patients. So there's, yes. there's a lot of options that they weren't, you know, years ago. So this is good news. It's not good news when you have a diagnosis of anything, but it is good news to know that there are treatment options. So I think and it's important for uh, the APPs to understand that and and to work in collaboration with the gastroenterologist. So that brings me to my next question. How, what does the team look like post-diagnosis for the patients? You know, how, how, what does that collaborative shared decision-making look like when you have the primary care and the gastroenterologist um, managing a patient with EOE? How does that look like? What does that look like? 
I think that is such an important part that you mentioned. You know, I think of eosinophilic esophagitis similar to inflammatory bowel disease, where really it takes a village, a multidisciplinary approach to treat it because it is a chronic disease that can flare up uh, if not treated adequately. And as my mentors used to say, one of my mentors used to say, swallowing and eating is 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 just uh, a right, you know, that every human should have and not have to suffer. So it's really, really important to be able for our patients to nourish their body and to be able to swallow. So what that looks like is, you know, good communication between primary care physician and a specialist, gastroenterologist, primary care provider, including the APPs and the gastroenterologist. And also in some cases, there is a dietitian involved, especially depending on the age of diagnosis of um, EOE and um, asthma. So an allergy and immunology specialist initially that may be on the board, on board on this team as well. So first, you know, somebody presents with symptoms. First and foremost, it's important to be vigilant, ask the right questions, have high suspicions, appropriate initial uh, testing, which they may present with severe enough symptoms that they're like, okay, you have to see a gastroenterologist and this is this is why they see a gastroenterologist, they undergo upper endoscopy with biopsies, the diagnosis is made, they may be referred to an allergist for uh, food testing and other autoimmune, like other testing for asthma as well, because that's very prevalent as well in EOE patients. And then they may be referred to dietitian as well. But most important part of this whole thing is that the patient understands what EOE is and what that means. Because a lot of times people will get on the right medication and they'll feel great and then they'll stop the medication. And it has a lot of implications because if they can't swallow, they can have food getting stuck, which is very, very scary and can lead to emergent you know, ER visits, requiring an urgent scope. Um, so to prevent all that, to be able to treat this very treatable disease, like you said, the good news, um, it's important for good communication, good understanding of the disease, and very, very important to follow up with these patients to make sure if the treatment plan is working or not. Dr. Sinkal, you brought up a really important point, um, and I want to just expand on that because I think this is so important as well, that EOE is a progressive disease. We've heard this over and over again, and you mentioned patients may be feeling good, so they stop the medication. Could you? And I think this is really important for the APPs, especially um, non-GIs who may not be aware of this. Can you expand on that a little more and why, you know, what what does that mean that it's progressive? What do they, what do patients and their providers, APPs need to know? And then what does that mean for surveillance and monitoring going forward? Absolutely, absolutely. So chronic immune mediated disease means that there are, there is a chance of having inflammation in that particular organ. And the organ we are talking about it is esophagus um, chronically. So what that means is Let's say if somebody's feeling better or partially feeling better, but they feel great and they stop taking their medication, well, at a tissue level, they may get the flare up where they have inflammation for a long time. And they may not become fully symptomatic till that inflammation starts leading to endoscopic manifestation of rings or severe scar tissue. And when it gets to that Point because it's not treated, it can really affect the motility of the esophagus. And esophagus is such an incredibly amazing organ because it works like an accordion. So when I, when I initiate a swallow, this muscle, this muscle, this muscle, this whole action of peristalsis has to be synchronized. So you can imagine if you have chronic untreated inflammation in your food pipe and it leads to scar tissue, it's really going to lead to really uh, bad motility. And that's irreversible. And that's really hard to treat. Any motility disorder in esophagus is 
poses a challenge to treat, and especially in this case where there could be extensive scarring or extensive extensive remodeling due to untreated inflammation. So what that means for monitoring? Well, after we get the patients on the right medication, like Dupexin, we rescope them in about eight to 12 weeks and take the biopsies. So endoscopically, we assess, oh yeah, there is improvement and there is an objective score endoscopically to assess that. And also we take tissue samples to be to make sure that those eosinophils are near zero or definitely less than 15. And that's a measure of remission. And it's really, really important uh, to continue to monitor that closely um, if a patient, when patient gets in remission, and then to rescope them and make sure they're staying in remission. So if a, if a APP has a patient who comes for their yearly checkup, what would be a, a question, a follow-up question to, to see if they're actually keeping up with their GI appointments? You know, I, I like the synchronicity yeah. of this team, and I want to kind of highlight what could, could these uh, APPs or primary care providers ask in an office visit to make sure that the patient is is keeping up with their um, their checkups, um, even though they may be feeling better, but we don't know what the tissue looks like. Exactly. I mean, that's that's great. That's a great question. You know, I think once a patient is in remission, they at least need to check in with a GI gastroenterologist once a year, and more often with the with the team member primary care provider. So some of the questions to ask would be, has your weight been stable? How are you eating? Are you are you eating uh, two to three times a day? If so, um, are you having any trouble with regurgitation, chest pain, chest discomfort, difficulty swallowing? Um, all those are very, very good questions. In the studies with Dupexin, there was something called dysphagia score. And those are some of the questions that were kind of asked, you know, to make sure that clinically we are not picking anything up. And if the patient is like, hey, I'm doing great, then it's also important to ask, well, okay, when was your last upper endoscopy? When did we check the tissue samples? And if it has been longer than, you know, one year, I think it's a very good idea for them at least to visit with their gastroenterologist once a year. Well, this has been so insightful, and I hope our listeners find it helpful in their practice. Uh, Thank you so much, and we look forward to talking with you again soon. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you so much for all you do. I am so grateful to uh, come back to your incredible, incredible podcast uh, that empowers patients and everybody with education. Thank you for listening to the Gastro Girl Podcast. For more information and resources, please visit gastrogirl.com. Do you have a question for Gastro Girl? Please email podcast at gastrogirl.com. The information, opinions, and recommendations presented in the Gastro Girl podcast are not a substitute for medical advice from your healthcare professional. Please consult a licensed clinician in your state regarding all matters related to your health.